Hi, today I want to talk about childhood autistic traits and I've got a very special guest to talk about that with me and it is my sister Afra who uh, writes the brilliant blog Mad Mom of Seven so do go and check that out and she obviously remembers my childhood because uh, Afra is a little bit older than me so she was sort of looking after me when I was a child and she was an, an older teenager. So has definitely got more memory of that period than I have in all likelihood. So um, I thought it would be really interesting for me and for you to have a little look at what childhood autistic traits I had and how that was from a sibling point of view. So let's get into it. Hi, Afra. Hi there. What is your connection? Because I know, although you're obviously my sister and I'm autistic, you have got a wider connection to autism than that. And you do write it about it a little bit on your blog. So do you want to explain the family autism tree, if you will? Well, you kind of planted the seed for the family autism tree in that, not that you were the first, but you were the first to be diagnosed, as far as I know, within our wider family. Mm -hmm. And um, as we, and, and certainly I've explored it, it is, it's quite, a big connection it's a big tree with lots of branches across actually both sides of the family and I, I also believe I've married into a family with <laughs> a strong <laughs> autistic set of traits as well so but obviously you know you were the first to to go out there and and get that diagnosis and it's been really interesting then to to kind of have all these light bulb moments of going oh well that explains so many things for about you about me about the family and then of course my own children one of whom you picked up within about 10 minutes of sitting down next to her um <laughs> <laughs> that was quite you know you do realize she's autistic oh now you come to mention it I can see that um, <laughs> um my youngest was diagnosed uh, a fair few years ago with the fabulous words from his consultants as well. He's clearly autistic. And, uh, and as you say, once you let the water settle and, and allow yourself time to look into the water, go, yeah, look at all these little autistic fishies swimming about in here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, glad to start a trend. It was actually Super Kid that got diagnosed first. She was the oh, first. Really? Yeah. yeah, she was oh. diagnosed about four months before me. And I was kind of like, uh, hang on, isn't that, so that's not, that's not typical. <laughs> right, yeah. I've got that too then. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting you say that because the more I've explored my own self, I, uh, yeah, I, I've come to the conclusion that it's not entirely neurotypical here as well, but I'm, I'm 52. I'm kind of, I'm happy in my own skin now. So I'm just going to take the lessons I've learned from you, my children, what works with other family members and just, you know, go yeah. with it. Uh, okay, so let's dive into little Ella. What a delight I was. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and ask, sort of, did you, obviously you were quite young yourself, but did you notice that I was different to other children? And at what kind of age, is, you know, at what kind of age did you realise that? Oh, from tiny. You were tiny. You weren't even at school age. Um, and but you were you were delightful. I mean, you were amazing. You were challenging. I'm not going to say you were an easy child, but you were hysterical. You were hyster and you still are. But you were hysterical from a very small age. But I think you know I've 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 given a lot of thought to this over the last few days, and it's really difficult because as we've acknowledged, very little of our family was neurotypical. It kind of what was normal was really difficult to interpret so I thought we were just quirky and that you were just quirky and that we our family just did things slightly differently I mean when I was born my, my parents were teenagers pretty much I think I mean they yeah. weren't very old I mean older teenagers not, 18, early 20s right early 20s yeah and they were like really cool parents I was born in the 60s so yeah they weren't they weren't typical they were quite hippie they were quite party conscious and so my upbringing didn't feel normal compared to my sibling not my friends and then so when you came along it kind of I just thought it was a continuation of that and I think it's only now that I'm really realizing actually it's everybody else was neurotypical and and that the neurodiversity was showing in that quirkiness in that creativity you were incredibly creative and I've had a conversation recently with somebody talking about um how amazing you are at performing from a very small age everything from 
the famous can I tell the famous church you can story? Yeah. I mean that was fantastic so uh very churchy as children due to an auntie and uh, Ella was cast as Mary I believe and you've got your very very favorite doll that you were very very attached to um, but the vicar's daughter also had a doll she was very attached to and when it came to the performance full congregation Ella done you know in the full Mary costume who then peers into the crib and shouts at the top of her voice that's not my baby <laughs> which was brilliant <laughs> but you used to stand up and sing and you were acting I mean you did like professional performances as a child and and somebody said well, that, well, well she can't be autistic then but but it, talking to my son now who also loves to perform he was in his drama club he explains it and I, I don't know if you can add to this he said I get it when somebody wants me to act and they've given me a direction and they're telling me who I've got to be because that's what I'm trying to do all of the time so now I see that that was a huge part of you making use of that masking skills that you'd had to develop and and, it, and using it for some fun and some entertainment and you know hard way to do it but it, it certainly paid off because you were incredibly creative and, and, and really you know the performing was almost constant <laughs> and it still hasn't stopped <laughs> <laughs> Wait, but yes <laughs> I mean I kind of managed to retire from officially being a performer had some kids and thought I was going to stay at home and then kind of found myself on the internet going hey still hey, look at me <laughs> what do you call it tap shoes and jazz hands yeah. jazz hands <laughs> yeah um yeah and I would also like to point out that the reason I said that's not my baby is that it was not my doll it was the yeah, that's what I meant daughter's to say. doll it that made it into the crib and it yes. therefore was not my baby so yeah my next question is uh, can you tell me about some of the things you noticed uh, when I was growing up through the autism lens? Like, for example, you've told me that it was often your job to walk me home from school because you were in a, a secondary school that was near to my primary school. Um, yeah. And that was challenging for you, from what I recall. <laughs> you did not want to walk. You did not want to talk to my friends. You just you just didn't want to do it for some reason and um, so we, there was much coaxing along the way which has, has borne me in good stead for having my own children obviously mm -hmm. and everything like you say from finger puppets to bribery apart from the one time where it didn't work and right outside the Catholic school where there were many many boys that I quite like the look of you thought you'd just take your clothes off <laughs> and uh, <laughs> cue me like hurriedly like scooping up this <laughs> child that was having quite the tantrum as we thought at the time and uh, hurrying sort of red-faced and hot as far away from the bus stop with all of the hot men as far as I possibly could <laughs> that um, really sticks my memory you took your tights off and everything in <laughs> about three seconds flat I've never seen anything like it I literally turned around to say come on Ella I was like ah, what are you doing <laughs> Quite a big ask, really, to ask a sort of 15, 16 year old girl to look after an autistic child in that kind of set of circumstances. So you did a good job. Um, and then I'm thinking about at home. Did I do any of the stuff like watching the same TV show over again? Was I into My Little Ponies? The kind of girl autism stuff. Yeah, yeah. I remember Care Bears being quite a biggie. I remember that being quite a big oh, thing. Care Bears. And I never Care got Bears. a Care Bear. Yeah, and then there was, oh, She-Ra and uh, He-Man, he is it? I mean, you literally watched that on complete loop. Um, and you liked dressing up as a nurse for quite a long time. And I remember spending quite a lot of my pocket money for your birthday. And, and there's a beautiful picture of you somewhere wearing this nurse's uniform with the most hilarious smile ever. You could not smile for about, well, most of your early childhood, you used to sort of do this thing with your hair and then pull this peculiar smile, which I've now seen my youngest do as well, on a, being asked to smile. No, can't. I don't know what face to pull. Was definitely your response to that most of the time. I but actually yeah, the say thing. that you can um, spot an autistic child from a family photo. <laughs> 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 I'd agree with that, yeah. <laughs> but yours is brilliant. I, I can picture that photo in my head of you in the uniform and, and the face and the smile. Um, yeah, and, and, and I think, thinking on it, there was quite the sensory thing. You were quite keen on particular clothes and it wasn't necessarily a look, but, but thinking about it, you know, you were, you were very keen on dresses as a child. I don't remember you in trousers at all. 
apart from you had some dungarees and that's the only set of trousers I can recall you wearing. I don't know if it's a thing, but you wore a lot of sort of very easy slip on dresses. Funnily enough, Wonder Girl only wore dresses up until really recently. She couldn't tolerate trousers, but I do remember being quite fun. They were brown corduroy dungarees. Yes, they were. Yes. And I did love them. Um, and then actually I went completely the other way and only wore trousers for about 10 years from kind of my mid-teens onwards. Yeah, it's an odd one that, isn't it? But yeah. yeah, I think the main thing I notice, and I don't know whether I'm jumping the gun here, and again, on on reflection, is is I used to worry a lot, and I know you used to worry about it because you used to talk about it, was, was the friendships. And you were desperate to, to make friends, and you were so, actually so outgoing in your own way, and you just couldn't understand, and we couldn't understand, and I couldn't understand why why you hadn't got hundreds of friends and in fact your one main friend was really from a, a not really very typical family she had quite an unconventional upbringing mm -hmm. and she was really the only constant that I can recall I mean I, rem I remember even small that you were questioning you know sort of I feel like I'm doing all the right things so why haven't I got friends um, and, and now actually thinking about how how you might have appeared to neurotypical children and to be fair, neurotypical parents who in this day and age, they're not that tolerant. So only knows what they were like back then. Mm -hmm. I think that was probably quite a big old clue that we just we just didn't interpret correctly. We just thought for some reason, maybe you were just too different which yeah. was a, a real shame. And I remember it being very difficult for you then. Yeah, no, friendship has always, I mean, it's fine now, obviously, but um, friendship was challenging. And I think looking back on it, that actually friendships are just incredibly complicated things to navigate. And I think for autistic uh, girls or non-binary people, particularly, um, you are expected to have a greater level of social skills than perhaps a boy might be expected to have. Yeah. And so it's even more complicated and the older you get, the more complicated it gets. And at the same time, you're being scarred by the failures, which isn't kind of setting you off on the right foot. And I guess I was being told at home, not necessarily by you, what might you change? Because that would be not knowing about autism. That would be the automatic. I'd probably do it with my kids. What is it you're actually doing? And how could we yes. do it to that? Um, so yeah. I was being told that it was me. Um, by not just at home but also by sort of teachers and head teachers and and so what we know now about self-esteem is that that's just completely the wrong approach but this was the 80s <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know we were still having teachers that were like banging down meter sticks next to us on the table and stuff that you just never hear of now um, no. yeah that was complicated but at the same time I think coming out of that what's been good is that I've learned some real skills for navigating all different kinds of people that serve yeah. me really well as an as an adult but I had to it's like I, if I were to write a book I'd call it how I screwed up so you don't have to and I would be <laughs> all the things I've learned with all the mistakes that I've made or that weren't necessarily mistakes but missed cross communications or whatever yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so uh then my next question for you is so how did because obviously if I were well I was an autistic child I was just like yeah, yeah, yeah. An autistic child um that probably meant that I got a greater share of kind of a lot of the attention I would imagine in terms of having tantrums they were called then but meltdowns and um how did that impact you growing up because you've got your own stuff going on presumably yeah, I mean, again, I was talking to this with my own children. I was saying, uh, you must only have been about seven or eight when I left home. Yeah. But I do remember before that, that you tended to melt down. Whereas in my neurodiversity, I'm a, I'm a hydro. I'm like my youngest son, he will shut down. And mm -hmm. I was really lucky that I had my own big bedroom and I used to just retreat into there. My parents were also busy with their own rubbish going on because obviously they split up um not long before I left home actually yeah um and yeah I and I did feel for you and mum really because you kind of were stuck with each other and I'd gone so I did try really hard to give a mum some respite and to give you a bit of kind of light relief with a with an older sister that could take you camping and we could eat rubbish and build fires yeah. <laughs> I'm remembering one particularly entertaining trip to western supermare <laughs> that's the <laughs> one I remember <laughs> <laughs> but the thing I remember about that is not the fact that we managed to set fire to the tent. Um, that's not the part I remember. The part I remember no, no. is that I've got wet feet and you bought me some new shoes that I really, really loved. And that's so autistic, isn't it? The thing I remember of that whole weekend is these flowery white 
plimsolls yeah. that you bought me. <laughs> yeah, I remember that as well. So yeah, I I, I felt I, I felt guilt because I felt I'd, I'd I'd abandoned the family and you and and then and then we went for quite a long period where I was busy. You know, got married and I moved down here and I had children and I, I, and we really did lose touch for a number of reasons. Mm. Um, and I think that was it because. Because when you'd have a meltdown, I just didn't understand it. And um, and I am, unfortunately, I've got that male brain that wants to fix things. And it's only now half a dec- half a century in, I'm realising that actually sometimes it's not the right thing to say, well, what can we do to fix it? Sometimes you just got to go, it's okay and I'm here. Yeah. Definitely. And I wished I'd learned that a long time ago. Yeah, I'd that's something that I, I tend to do as well. Maybe it's something that we both get from having been uh parented by the same people that's probably enough detail um put that in the book of things we've gone through so you don't have to yeah exactly so you know when someone comes to me with with a problem my first thing is right okay well obviously what we have to do is x y and z and people don't always want that and in fact I, I think I would come to you in sort of early meltdown, particularly in the teenage years when I would ring you a lot and you try and problem solve. And then that's obviously more stimulation, isn't it, going in? Yeah. And then that would just be unreasonable. And you'd just be like, well, okay, I'm just trying to help. Sure, bye. Yeah. <laughs> As you would, without you would. the knowledge that we have now, which I think makes a really big difference. Um, yeah, so uh, the next question I had, you've sort of covered, but what kinds of adjustments did you make uh did you find yourself making with me being autistic because I feel like you did still make adjustments in the way that you did things even though you might not have officially known that's why you were doing it well actually it's it's something that I learned very early on with you and and actually other members of the family which have carried through to my life and that people say makes me really empathic but actually I'm not I am just really good now at predicting what might happen and planning it so I always have a plan a b and c and possibly d because I'd know if 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 something happened with you that there needed to be some quick scenarios you know if you were hungry I needed to be able to predict that because I knew you were more likely to have a tantrum as we called it if you were hungry and Mm. I think we can say that's probably still true today isn't it yeah definitely hungry there's a word for it now though isn't there yeah there is even a word for it now and um and down to the stimulation and down to the attention and the entertainment of you and it was just learning what worked with you and what really didn't and anticipating what scenarios might come up during whatever we were going to do and being prepared for it and it's that has stood me in really good stead Mm -hmm. yeah no that's interesting that you say that because as you're saying that I'm thinking about all the trips we took like we went into London for the day and we went to Whipsnade Zoo and like I mean we went with you say we lost touch during that period but my memory is that we did regularly go and do stuff or I would come and stay with you where you ended up moving with uh, your husband and your new baby um and I don't remember any occasions where things just went wrong and I felt overwhelmed and when no. I think about other trips, so you must have, I guess, maybe been managing that a little bit for me. Because to yeah. do a whole day in London, and we visited all the sites, didn't we? Because I wanted to see like Big Ben and the yeah, yeah. and whatnot. To do that without my memory overridingly being st- stimulation <laughs> overload is quite impressive, really. So it became really obvious that making little adjustments, like taking you in the car to London, was going to be much more successful than forcing you to go through 40 minutes on the train and the tube and the railway station and all that so you know you could occupy yourself in your own little zone while we're in the car and arrive there sort of you know almost as good as new to enjoy the rest of the trip and it's just little things like that 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 seem to make a big difference um and my last question is uh, which is going to lead into a bigger discussion in a video we're going to make for the purple people. Um, so the short answer to what difference does knowing I'm autistic make to you? Oh, it's improved our relationship, literally 100%, I'd say, because the, I'm able to research and to understand and to listen in a, a completely different way. Yeah, I think that's true. Like for me... I feel like I was always slightly scared of screwing up with you. Always like, always desperate to have a great relationship with you. I've always wanted that. I've never felt that I didn't want that because you are a lot of fun. You really are. Um, And in a similar way to me. So we do have a good laugh together, don't we? Yeah. Um, So I always wanted that, but I think I probably like, you know, when you're trying too hard because you're like, oh God, I really don't want to say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing and mess this all up. Um, So it was always just slightly tense because when someone's like that in a relationship, you can sense it when someone's not relaxed around you, can't you? Um, And I guess over the last, 
And then there was a period of time when we weren't really in contact because it just wasn't working for either of us. So we just took a bit of a break. And um, coming back together about, I guess about four years ago now, because we've taken it very slowly, haven't we? The yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Over the last few years, particularly, I guess I've stopped feeling that way, feeling like yeah. I could just, that I've just got to tread really carefully and not make a social mistake with you because you know that I'm autistic and you hopefully know that I love you and that my motivation, like why I don't need, I don't have to have a relationship with you. You don't have to have a relationship with me, but we still make the effort because we want that. So yeah. it'll probably all be okay. And hopefully the more relaxed I am, the more easy the relationship is for you. Because to be frank, you have a lot going on in your life. Afra's got um, seven children, uh, which, is obviously even as they're adults they're still needing you and you've got so you've got like a lot of social stuff to deal with a lot of kids to deal with you've got uh, you know your husband and you're quite an active person socially anyway and with the church um so I guess my overriding feeling these days is that this part this relationship that we have needs to be something that's a nice addition to both of our lives because we've both just got yeah. too much else to care about to get into drama over nonsense frankly <laughs> Right. Yeah. And, and I think that's the trouble because we both have our own issues. And I think the reason our relationship was so strange for quite a long time is we were both bringing up very small children with their own issues. Yeah. So actually piling, trying to sort our own relationship on the top of that was doomed to failure, given that we didn't understand each other at all. Yeah, definitely. I think it wasn't a bad thing that we both just got on with the hard graft of <laughs> nappies and buggies. And then it's like, oh, hey, so I've got an autism diagnosis now. Should we try again? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. Well, I think I'm going to wrap that up now. And as I've said, Afra and I are going to go now and record another video for the Purple People, exploring a little bit more those kinds of relationships that might have been challenging at times because of the lack of knowledge about having basically kind of slightly different kinds of brains and how, to, if you want to, you can potentially move forward with that and how to protect yourself while doing that, I guess. Because I think we've navigated that very well. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> Chaos, yeah. um, thanks for watching this video i hope you've enjoyed it and found it useful if you have don't forget to like the video and if you like the kind of content that i make about autism and adhd then perhaps consider subscribing to my channel you know whatever and uh, finally if you really like what i'm doing and you'd like to make it possible for me to keep doing it as a job i actually have a members club where people can join and for a small monthly Fee. they're basically supporting me as a creator to keep doing this and in exchange I make uh, an exclusive video every month and I run a discord group for everyone to hang out and it's a delightful group so uh, only you know spend responsibly if you've got ADHD do think first but if you can afford it that would be great uh, thanks for watching bye bye